Hello, this is Andrew Wolf. In this video, I'm continuing my series on acute care of oncology patients. And in particular, I'm focusing on oncologic emergencies. And I will be talking about venous thromboemboli in cancer patients. And why is this an oncologic emergency? Well, of course, venous thromboemboli can lead to pulmonary emboli, um, which can be a life-threatening condition. Now, interestingly enough, the incidence of uh, venous thromboembolism in cancer patients has been reported um, in, in the literature in about uh, 11 to 15 percent of cancer patients, but there are actually um, some studies that show on autopsy of cancer patients that up to 50 percent of patients have been ha found to have a DVT or a PE at the time of autopsy. So uh, a DVT and, or P DVT and PE are very common uh, conditions that occur in cancer patients. Now, also, another fact that's um, important to note is that venous thromboembolism is the number two cause of death of cancer patients. Okay, so um, it, this is something, if you're taking care of cancer patients, this is uh, something to consider. Now, also, on the flip side of that, it's important to remember that cancer is a common cause of DVT. So if you have a patient uh, presenting with a DVT, then uh, you know cancer should be on your differential. Now what does that mean? That doesn't mean that I'm recommending that everybody that presents with a DVT needs, uh, you know, needs a, an instant PAN scan, but it does mean that if you have a patient that presents with a newly diagnosed DVT, you should have cancer in the back of your mind and you should be asking those important history questions like have you had significant weight loss, have you had uh, you know, have you had significant fatigue? Have you had a chronic cough? Have you had changes in bowel and bladder habits? Um, have you had any evidence of, uh, of GI bleeding? Those other um, common signs and symptoms that uh, that we went over in an uh, earlier video that um, that patients with cancer commonly present with. So I'm just uh, suggesting that you really sort of keep cancer in the back of your mind if you have a patient with a newly diagnosed uh, DVT because it is always a possibility. Now I want to talk a little bit about now it, I did do a uh, a full video on um, venous thromboemboli in my hematology lecture series. And, um, but I'm going to briefly go over uh, Virchow's triad uh, because it's important to understand sort of the, the base, this basic concept in understanding um, why we develop uh, thromboemboli in, in our bodies. Now, basically, Vir Virchow was a, uh, was a patho, uh, physio or physiologist that, uh, that lived uh, several hundred years ago. And he um, proposed that three conditions needed to be in place in order for us to develop um, to develop a thrombus in our veins. And one of those um, was venous stasis. That means the blood uh, flow needed to be sort of interrupted so that um, so that you know if the blood is holding still, it will have a greater tendency to clot. Um, there needed to be sort of a hypercoagulable condition. So the blood needs to be in a hypercoagulable state. And there has to be endothelial injury or injury to the vessel. You know, it's interesting though because by injury really, you know, I think that also the, the endothelial cells don't necessarily need to be injured but um, they, they do need to be stimulated as if they were injured. And, you know, if, if you think of the sort of, if you picture the endothelial cells lining uh, the vessels, um, they can be directly injured themselves or they could be stimulated to react as if they're injured. So sort of react um, with in, inflammatory mediators because of the presence of certain proteins or chemicals in, in the blood.
So endothelial, I'm using the term endothelial injury um, relatively loosely here, and I want you to keep that in mind that, um, you know, it could be a direct, you know, sort of damage to the endothelial cells, or it could be stimulation of surface receptors on the endothelium um, to, to respond to certain chemicals. Um, and this will be important as we talk about um, how uh, venous thromboemboli form in, in cancer patients. Now, Virchow proposed that all three of these um, derangements, you know, we have to have significant venous stasis, a significant hypercoagulable state, and endothelial injury um, in order for a, a venous thromboembolism to form. But we understand now that if we have extreme stasis, extreme, uh, a, an extreme hypercoagulable state, or extreme endothelial injury, just one of these um, or two of them together may be enough to cause a thrombus to form. Um, so all three of these um, do not need to be um, in place for a thrombus to form. Um, it really, we need to sort of consider the, the balance of all three of these together. And you know, if, if, if one of them is significant enough, it can cause a thrombus in and of itself. Now this is very important to consider in cancer because cancer can become, um, can be a very significant hypercoagulable state. So you can have a young, you know, I've seen patients with, um, you know, lymphoma or leukemia that are otherwise young, healthy, and active that have no, no known mechanism for endothelial injury and no venous stasis, but they have a very extreme hypercoagulable state that causes them to, uh, to develop a thrombus. So what causes this hypercoagulable state? Well, remember in a few videos ago, I talked about uh, the different factors that, um, that are involved with cancer that causes its um, sort of in interesting uh, systemic effects. And one of these is the aberrant proteins that are uh, produced by the mutated uh, cancer cells. And that is one factor involved here. And then the other major factor involved is the host response or immune system response. So host responses. And these are really sort of the two factors that are involved in creating this hypercoagulable state that we often see in, in cancer patients that leads to it being such uh, a, you know, venous thromboembolism being so common in, in cancer patients. So let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology that's going on here. And here we have a uh, picture of the coagulation cascade with the various factors involved. And what we have with, uh, with cancer patients is we have, you know, cancer cells. You know, we've got these sort of mutated cancer cells that, uh, you know, have mutated DNA. And remember, mutated DNA are creating aberrant proteins, right? So we've got these aberrant proteins that are getting produced by these cells and secreted by them. And these aberrant proteins do some interesting things. One of the aberrant proteins is called cancer procoagulant. And cancer procoagulant actually directly triggers by its own unique process. So we've got these, you know, proteins that come down here and directly trigger factor 10 to activate and become factor 10A. And this um, stimulates through its own independent pathway uh, the coagulation cascade to occur. All right. Now, the other factor that's sort of been identified is, you know, all cell, pretty much all cells in the body have present on them uh, proteins on the cell membrane called tissue factor. All right, and when the cells, when the cells sort of get broken up because they're injured, um, they um, float through the bloodstream and stimulate factor seven to become factor seven A and this activates the extrinsic pathway for clotting. Now, for some reason, that's not well understood in cancer because, you know, it's interesting is be the more strange and mutated a cell, uh, a cancer cell becomes, the less tissue factor it actually, um, it actually produces and expresses on the cell membrane. But 
what we know is that patients with cancer have very high levels of what's called uh, tissue bearing micropart or tissue factor bearing microparticles um, that are floating through the bloodstream. And this isn't because the cancer cells are necessarily producing more tissue factor, but it's probably because um, the tumors are sort of creating and breaking down so many, so many cells so quickly that we just have um, more tissue factor present in the bloodstream. And again, this is, you know, this theory is not really well understood, but in any case, we know that we have a lot of this tissue factor um, bearing micro microparticles in the bloodstream, and this also stimulates the, it, this stimulates the extrinsic pathway um, to clot. And we know that if we treat um, tumor, you know, if we treat cancer with chemotherapy or, or radiation, these, the number of tissue factor bearing microparticles goes down and the hypercoagulable state um, cools off and the patients have less of a tendency to clot. So these are two of the factors that we understand. There are probably other aberrant proteins involved that we just haven't identified yet um, that we may identify later that lead to this hypercoagulable state. So the next factor that we know is involved with uh, venous thromboembolism in cancer is that, uh, you know, sort of involves the host response. So we've got sort of T cells that are um, interacting with, with the cancer cells and the proteins that they're producing. And the T cells are revving up and they're cranking out cytokines. And the cytokines are like, you know, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. Um, and you know various interleukins, interleukin one, interleukin six, and you know TNF alpha in particular has been studied in relation to to DVT, and it directly stimulates and uh, interacts with the receptor in the endothelial cells and causes a procoagulant response and suppresses fibrin the some of the fibrinolytic activities of the endothelial cells. So again, this is not, you know, the TNF, uh, the tumor necrosis factor in interleukin um, interaction with endothelial cells is not necessarily an, an endothelial injury, but it activates the endothelial cells as if they're injured. So they're responding, um, you know, as if they are injured and um, sort of supporting this, uh, you know, their contribution to the venous thromboembolism. So, okay, now venous stasis, how does that occur? Why does that occur commonly in cancer patients? Well, you know, obviously we talked about how commonly it is that uh, cancer patients have fatigue. So, um, you know, it's not common, it's not uncommon for cancer patients to be, um, you know, sort of bed bound. And cancer patients, you know, during treatment are often hospitalized. Um, and commonly have surgery, um, so there is that issue. Then also, you know, we can add to that the fact that they very frequently have central lines in place, and the the central lines can sort of partially um, obstruct uh, the upper extremity veins, and that can lead to venous thromboembolism. And then you can have direct compression of the veins from surrounding uh, surrounding masses, and then um, you know there can be comorbidities. Um, in particular comorbid conditions that are known in, in cancer patients to increase the likelihood of DVT are, you know, is obesity. And it's not really a comorbidity, but it's a factor, age. Okay, in my next video, I'm going to continue the series on oncologic emergencies, and I will be talking about hypercalcemia. I will see you there.